Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast from Equifax, where we break down the latest economic and credit insights to help you navigate today's business landscape. Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast. I'm your host, Catherine Doe, a product marketing director here at Equifax for our risk portfolio. FinTech solutions have revolutionized the financial ecosystem, finding new ways to enhance the customer experience, transform accessibility, and make payments faster, among many other benefits. But this isn't enough to shield this part of the financial industry from our current economic headwinds. We're observing that VC funding is drying up, there's limited access to cost-effective debt financing, and capital is more costly to lend. In this episode, we'll be speaking with Ritinder Betty, Chief Credit Officer at SoFi, about how he believes fintechs can manage and weather these challenges. Before we get started, let's set the stage with a quick economic update from David Fieldhouse, Director of Consumer Credit Analytics at Moody's Analytics. David? Thank you, Catherine. Despite facing challenges from higher interest rates, the U.S. economy remains resilient. The job market is strong with a steady growth of around a quarter of a million people per month or new jobs per month, which is a really solid foundation. Consumer spending it has been sturdy and is helping to keep the economy moving forward. In fact, real personal spending is expected to increase by 0.1% in May. And income is going to move up as well based on our expectations by about 0.2%. The U.S. economy is expected to experience slower growth throughout the year, though, and there is a risk of recession being caused by the Federal Reserve potentially over-tightening. Real GDP has growth has decelerated since the third quarter of last year and is expected to remain slow. The U.S. potential growth rate is estimated to be about 2%, and and we're going to be below that throughout the year. That's our expectation. And, And really, we're feeling that we're at the end of an expansion in terms of business cycles. Conference board's leading economic index declined by 0.7% in May, and that's a 14th straight month of decline. I, I, I do want to give some caution here that the indicators are not as dire as they might suggest, and we are really not expecting a recession, though. The re- recent rate pause in June will be welcome news for prospective home buyers as mortgage rates have continued to drift down recently. And additionally, the housing market seems to have found its floor, with May's existing home sales increasing by 0.2%. And, and that really signals that there's a, a bottom in housing demand. So we expect some, some growth in the housing market demand going forward. Balance growth across all credit products will decelerate as the calendar moves into the second half of the year. Performance will wane, bringing late payment rates in line with what we saw prior to the pandemic. And the normalization will be uneven across products. Residential lending has seen little stress, but we've seen stress in auto and personal loan segments. Furthermore, the impact from the economy is really starting to be realized in the credit card space. But fortunately, you know, while there might be pockets of weakness, we, we feel that they're too small to trigger any type of downturn. Thanks, Kevin. Back to you. All right. Thank you, David. On our June 15th Market Pulse webinar, we focused on how fintechs are tackling economic headwinds and tighter credit. Ritinder Betty was a guest on that webinar, and he joins us again today to continue the conversation. Welcome, Ritinder. Glad to have you back. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. So, thanks for yeah, having me. Thank you. Uh, during our webinar, we conducted a poll and asked our audience. What is the biggest challenge your organization is facing in 2023? Um, And according to our poll, the majority of attendees at 52% said it was persistently high inflation and rising interest rates. And then another 38% said it was loan applicant quantity and quality. That leaves only about 5% that answered reduced private equity investments or the expected impact of restarting student loan payments was their biggest challenge. So with that information, I'm curious what you think of these results. Does this align with what you're seeing at SoFi? What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think those results make a ton of sense. And honestly, I, I probably would have answered them the same way if I took the poll. You know, during COVID, we saw record numbers when it came to consumer savings. And now that's basically gone, right? So consumers are relying more on credit cards. And with interest rates where they are, the average credit card payment has increased quite a bit. 
And then you think about things like mortgage lending, right? We know what's happening there given high rates and you know, the, a refi business that's essentially on pause. You know, you have sellers who can't even think about selling. I think about myself, you know, I'm in a fixed rate under 3%. I'm not going anywhere. And so the nice thing about us at SoFi is we have a pretty diversified business. So, you know, at the moment, personal loans are super attractive to prime and super prime borrowers because, you know, if they have high interest credit card debt, where if you think about credit card debt over the last 12, 15 months, APRs have gone up somewhere between Five, 600 basis points. Yet personal loans have probably increased at about half that clip. So call it 250, 300 basis points. So it's a pretty attractive product for those who have higher interest credit card debt. And then when interest rates start to come back down, we'll see our student loan refi business and our home loans business start to pick up. So we're able to kind of manage through different cycles because we're not just relying on a monoline product. Right. Yep. And and I actually wanted to dig at that just a, a little bit further. So you mentioned the student loan refi business, and we know we're coming to a point where the end of the deferments is is up, or we see it in the, the future. And I have friends that have raved about SoFi and, and refinancing and consolidating. What, what does that mean for your business? And what do you think the impacts will be maybe for SoFi, but taking a larger look for fintechs or, or the industry and opportunities in general? Yeah, so I, I think we're obviously very excited about kind of the pause ending because, you know, we can start helping our members again. So those with, with higher interest rate loans or those who, you know, are trying to maybe manage payment size by refinancing at a longer loan term, even if, you know, the interest rate benefit isn't huge, but it allows them to have some flexibility in sort of their free cash flow, you know, their liquidity will be there for them. I think it's it's really unfortunate, honestly, that we had the pause for as long as we did because interest rates were so low. And you had these consumers out there who effectively thought forgiveness was coming. And while we are very supportive of forgiveness, you know, we think forgiveness does make sense. And we've been publicly super supportive of that. It's just that those high earners who were probably unlikely to ever get, you know, forgiveness missed out on an opportunity to refinance their student loan debt at a much lower rate. And so, you know, hopefully rates will come back down and and we'll be there for them. But we're very excited about, you know, that business starting to come back. So I'm going to go back to the webinar and you had mentioned that SoFi has a playbook for economic downturns and we would love to hear um, a little bit more about that. But you made the point that most fintechs today weren't around in 2008 or 2009, which is a great point. Um, So can you tell us more about your playbook, what that entails and, and how you build something like that from the ground up? Sure. Um, So our playbook really entails two parts. It kind of looks at what we're seeing internally and what the macro environment looks like. So on, you know, if you just look at them, if you think about the macro side, we've looked for leading indicators that have been very predictive of past recessions and really kicked the tires on each one of those indicators to say, in today's world, in today's environment, does that indicator still make sense because the world has changed so much and you know, you hear a lot of a lot of smart people a lot of economists out there say you know it's it's hard to look at the historical data because things are so different today than they were in the you know during the financial crisis 2008 2009 and then you know recessions prior to that and so what we do is you know as an example you know we'll look at things that have been predictive in the past like diminished auto sales or diminished auto manufacturing you know that was a very solid indicator of uh, in terms of predicting a future recession however like given what's happened over the last few years when 
you think about the chip shortage, when you think about factory shutdowns and manufacturing slowdowns, we didn't think that indicator was a good one, right? Like we didn't, we didn't think it made a ton of sense to look at that one. So instead, we've looked for those things that have been predictive in the past and we feel like they make sense in today's world. And so just an easy example of that is consumer confidence, right? We it's it's one of our it's one of our 10 indicators and we feel like hey, it, it still makes sense to look at consumer confidence. And then internally, we're really focused on what we think are leading indicators, things like, are we seeing more of our members calling into customer service or collections asking for payment assistance? Uh, what are they telling us, right? Is there, are, are we gathering some qualitative feedback from our representatives? Are we reading through our notes and, and seeing themes emerge? Or are we seeing jumps in our early month on book delinquency? Is it harder for us to contact delinquent customers? You know, are, are our contact rates coming down? So there's a variety of things we look at that, you know, we, we don't want to look at lagging indicators like unemployment and are really focused on what, what do we think those leading indicators are. And to your point, you know, because we don't have data going back to 2008, we frankly rely on third parties who specialize in areas like stress testing. So they take our data and they run it through their proprietary models, which were built on data from prior crises, and they'll come back with different scenarios for us. So based on what we're seeing in our playbook in terms of our, our leading indicators saying, hey, we think the probability of a recession is increasing or has increased to a certain level, we'll then go back to those scenarios and then apply the right one to our future outlook and then make and then make the necessary changes to adjust. And that could be as simple as you're tightening credit, or it could be things like I'm gonna do more income verification or I'm gonna do more employment verification, etc. So so there's there's so many different things you can look at. There's so many different levers, but that's kind of the philosophy we have. Very smart. And we're all kind of trying to be nimble and agile as as we go here. So I wanted to talk about generative AI, which is a big topic across all industries. How have you found success or for this to work for your business and using it to find opportunities or manage risk? Yeah, SoFi was an early adopter of machine mm -hmm. learning, and we feel really good about how we use machine learning across risk management. We have a a very strong kind of model risk management and sort of model governance team, a lot of effective challenge between, you know, the team that develops the models and then more of a, a model validation and governance team. So we feel that's a pretty healthy relationship. There are models that we build that never see daylight because they didn't pass the scrutiny of our governance team. And so we feel good about that. With that said, though, we're not necessarily thinking about using AI to help us with things like credit models today. But we are, uh, I'd say we're, we're kicking the tires on some interesting things in areas like fraud prevention, where, where maybe... Maybe, you know, AI could potentially help us. And that's one area within kind of risk modeling that, that we're looking at AI. But what I tell you is we're really more excited about the capability to leverage it for um, making both our processes and our people more efficient. So how can we use AI to assist a customer service representative or a collector to do their jobs more efficiently, more effectively, create a better member experience. So you do side-by-sides with some of these agents and their roles are incredibly hard, right? They have a customer on the phone, they're they're going through 10, 15 different screens, they're, they're taking notes. And so if you could have AI kind of in the background listening in, popping up the right screen for the right situation, just making the whole thing a lot smoother. That's what, what excites us. And we really feel like it, it will take out a lot of the low value work and just make 
calls run more efficiently, faster, and you know that's what what every member wants. And our agents will be able to serve more people. And then there's frankly other back office things that we're we're looking at. Where you know today our our risk strategy team builds a a strategy. They then take that strategy and they give it to our risk infrastructure team. And someone then has to interpret that strategy. They have to code it. They have to test it. And so could you significantly reduce that cycle time and move even faster by having generative AI assist in that translation of the strategy to code, deployment, and testing that's i think where at least we're we're moving towards and and that's that's pretty exciting for us how do leading fintechs acquire more customers mitigate fraud and make better business decisions they leverage the unique data and solutions only equifax can offer let our rich differentiated data predictive analytics and cloud native technologies fuel your innovation and drive success Visit Equifax.com forward slash fintech for details. Exciting indeed. And it's it's great to hear you. Um, that seems like a common thread to a lot at SoFi is the experience and sounds like you're you're working towards that for your members. Absolutely. It's our it's our first value, putting members first. A lot of times when when we're thinking about things like, you know, I've I've worked at larger financial institutions and it's always been about how much can we save from a from a dollar's perspective, whether it's you know expense reduction, whether it's loss savings. But at SoFi, the focus is really on that member and creating you know memorable experiences for for them and and creating that that stickiness within our ecosystem so folks don't leave or they don't feel the need to have to. Yeah, leave. yeah, and that's that's important. You know your north star, and it's obviously clear that through all ranks and, and positions at your company, it, it rings true. So that's great to hear. Yep. Okay. So here's a good question from our, our webinar audience. We know the fintech space is known for and really born from innovation. And we had an attendee ask, what uh, is the fintech space doing differently from traditional banks in terms of strategy, product development, and solutions? And, and what do you think are the key differences? I know we kind of touched on this, but I, I would be curious to hear your opinion on the true differentiation. Sure. So I'll, I'll put the member piece aside since we, we talked about that, just that member focus. What I'd say is we, I, I put it down to two things. One, we move just incredibly fast. We're maniacally focused on, you know, iterating, 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 like our, our CEO, he speaks a lot in, in different forums and, you know, he repeats this phrase, we're going to iterate, 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 learn, then iterate some more. And that's just really part of our DNA. You know, I've been doing this for over 20 years and I've never, and I've, I've always been in risk management, but I've, I've never worked at an organization that launched multiple pricing tests every week and has the discipline to read those results every week, even if you have 30 data points, you know, we're talking about those 30 data points and obviously disclaiming that the, the sample size is probably not large enough for us to make any reads, but we're, we're talking about it. And then I'd say the other thing that's different about us in particular, I haven't, I haven't worked at other fintechs really, so it's, it's hard for me to comment on them. But at SoFi, what I'd say is we're not as siloed as the traditional players and when I say siloed, I'm going to mean that a couple of different ways. I think one is organizationally. We don't really have organizational silos. At the end of the day, everybody's accountable to the same person. We're all in the same room together. We're all in sort of one team. The other place where I think traditional players are more siloed is on the infrastructure side. If I think back to my own career, you know, I worked at a, at a large bank in their student loan area and wanted to partner with other lines of business to figure out how could we make our products work better together to sort of create more of a of a shared value proposition for our customers to create that stickiness and frankly it was 
it was impossible because one, I couldn't even get people to pick yeah. up the phone, right, or return emails because they're like, you know, who's this guy? <laughs> yeah. Do, do we even have a student loan business? <laughs> right. or, you know, we had one. And so we're, everybody's incentivized differently. You're in different P&Ls. You report up different chains. And then, you know, even if they did pick up my calls, it, it would have probably been almost impossible to do things because the infrastructure was different. The platforms were different. And so when I think about SoFi, you know, we've thought about that. But it's not that everything's perfect and, and it's like utopia at SoFi. No, but we are, we are built in a way where we can move faster. We've thought about the infrastructure. And even if to move quickly, the decision was made that, you know, okay, we're going to have two different platforms because that's the fastest way we can deploy. The thought of one day bringing the platforms together hasn't gone away. And there's work happening behind the scenes to sort of see that vision come true. I think at, at larger institutions, some of that gets lost. Yeah, and I'm sure some of that comes with just, there's not many fintechs that aren't still in some degree of the the startup phase just by the nature of um, the industry and, and the business. But it's interesting you were you were speaking about that. And I could think about the old business book I had to read years ago of Stephen Covey and begin with the, the end in mind. And all these years later, even in this very modern industry, it still rings very true. Yeah, absolutely. So I think this is another question from our webinar attendees. Given all we've we've talked about with the, the differentiators of the fintech space, what makes them most resilient during a downturn? Do you think it's just the ability to be agile and, and nimble? Or is, is there anything else you, you might point to? Yeah, I, I think that's that's probably the the key the fact that we can move you know relatively quickly as changes happen in the environment you can react to that you can put in new strategies pretty quickly test them very quickly we're sort of built to move at that speed but the other thing is i you know we we do a lot of ads and you, you'll see us on social media and it's essentially our members our members talking about their products and that's all real like before I joined SoFi, I was like, eh, I don't know how much of that is actually real. And, you know, are these actors? And, and honestly, it, the members love our products and they love the platform. And so I think that also helps us in situations where, you know, we might see a turn in the economy. Like, you know, there's the whole notion of top of wallet. And so having that, that member loyalty, that customer loyalty, hopefully that benefits us as well. Okay, Ratinder, I think we've kind of wrapped up all of our, our questions and we, we got our webinar attendees questions answered as well. Um, so I'm going to end with my final question that I always love to ask when we have SMEs join our podcast. What are we not talking about? What is our industry or maybe the fintech space not talking about that you think that we should be? What are we missing? Yeah, I think there's something that folks within the industry are talking a lot about, but it's not necessarily making its way into mainstream media or like the headlines. And, and it's, it's really not just an issue that is facing, you know, that fintechs are facing. I think every, everybody in financial services is facing this and it's really fraud. I think Fraud is is ramping up identity theft, you know, application fraud. The just the sophistication of the attacks is just it's mind blowing. And there's a lot of there's a lot of data. There are a lot of tools out there that that can help. You know, we're, we're, everybody's looking at biometrics. You know, we talked about AI, and so I think. As a industry and, and maybe even as a as a country, like we, we need to get our arms around this and really think through what are what are some systemic ways of stopping this, you know, at a at a much higher level versus every single player in the industry kind of dealing with this on their own and then figuring out ways 
to prevent it or to, to mitigate it. But I, I honestly don't think it's something as a country we're talking enough about. Yeah, that's that's good insight. And, you know, it is an Equifax podcast, so I can't help but plug that that's a growing area of our business as well as, as our fraud mitigation business. Yeah, absolutely. So th- th- thank you again, Retainer. It was great having you. If any of our audience um, for this podcast would like to follow up with you directly, how might they find you? Uh, LinkedIn. I'm, I'm on LinkedIn, so probably the best way to reach awesome. me. Awesome. Well, thank you again. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please tell your friends about us and subscribe. If you'd like to send our team any questions or suggested topics for future episodes, you can email us at marketpulsepodcast at equifax.com. And don't forget to register for our Market Pulse webinar series. You can do that at equifax.com forward slash Market Pulse. Our team of experts work hard to provide relevant economic and credit insights to help your business make more confident decisions and build resilience to help you focus on forward. Thank you for listening and hope you'll join us next time. The information and opinions provided in this podcast are intended as general guidance only and are subject to change without notice. The views presented during the podcast are those of the presenter as of the date this podcast was recorded and do not necessarily reflect official positions of Equifax. Investor analysts should direct inquiries using the contact us box on the investor relations section at Equifax.com.